176 people arrested, 132 policemen injured, 1,576 businesses looted or set on fire. And yet, it started innocently. At first, it seemed like 1965 all over again, New Yorkers pitching in to help each other. Jeff Kamen was on the street with an Action News film crew soon after the lights went out. Less than an hour after the electric light failed, individual New Yorkers in most neighborhoods were directing traffic. But in the worst slums of the city, the light of mindless violence lit up the sky as the blackout divided the town into two societies, separate and unequal. In the Bronx, in Harlem, in South Jamaica, in Brooklyn, many of the have-nots abandoned whatever restraint had kept them in check. Tens of thousands of poor became a disorganized army of the night. Others hustled, too. The last few candles going. This is it, the last few candles of the day, right? What price are you asking for? Well, I was selling boxes for $3 a box, or so these for 50 cents each. Isn't that a bit of a rip-off? No, not really. Well, it's, uh, there's a blackout going on, and people are going for it. Oh. It was party time on Manhattan's fashionable east side, an evening of quick, easy friendships. Outside a luxury apartment house, I found friendly neighbors. Where were you when the lights went out? I was in a class at NYU, and the professor said she thought we could go home. <laughs> and you, sir? I was lounging in my easy chair watching a hell of a good movie. But fortunately, I keep an emergency bag that I take up in the North Woods, and I reached in and turned on all my lights. <laughs> we could all learn a lesson yeah. from you. Where were you, sir? I was looking for my old lady. <laughs> Where were you when the lights went out? The lights went out. I was in the movies in seeing this side of midnight. And it was a terrific movie and a great sexy scene, and it suddenly blacked out, and everybody almost fainted. But there was no party at Bellevue Hospital. The blackout there triggered an immediate life and death crisis. The blackout of 1965 forced hospitals to install backup generators. Bellevue's failed. Only fast work by teams of firemen and emergency service cops got power into emergency rooms and intensive care wards in time to fight off death. Doctors and nurses had to use primitive hand-powered airbags to keep alive 15 patients who had been on electrically powered respirators. Just as this woman was being rushed in with a miscarriage, a healthy seven and a half pound baby girl was being celebrated in the obstetrics wing. She had been delivered from darkness into the light of an emergency generator, carried in by a fireman at the last moment. North of the civilized ordered compassion of the blacked out hospital, thousands of East Harlem residents had taken to the streets in an orgy of looting and burning that shocked many of their neighbors. For it was not only the hardened criminals, the known felons of Spanish Harlem who had joined the human locust swarm. The cover of total darkness allowed the lowest qualities of previously peaceful people to surface. At first, there was only sporadic rock and bottle throwing at police. Later, there were shots fired. The cops were hard pressed to keep cool. Looting, people running, shots being fired. You know, at you, right? You see you come out of the block, you know, towards our direction. More than 3,000 people were arrested during the blackout. Street cops tell me that was but a small fraction of the reality. Tens of thousands learned crime can pay. These are not the tools of a community affairs officer, but Detective Mike Williams has had to use them tonight. Why? It's strange, Jeff. Uh, years ago, 1965, right? The first blackout, I was a rookie in the 2-5. And at that particular time, everybody out there in the street was trying to help somebody. This time, it's all different. It seems like they've just gone wild. But tonight, even now, if you go down on 96th Street, south of 96th Street, you see John Q. Citizen out there in his white clothes so he can be seen by the traffic lights, directing traffic. I was in a 2-4, and three people came up and said, what can we do to volunteer? It was really something, you know, it's... it's but once you move north of 96th Street into the ghetto, I don't say ghetto, it's just they have an idea. It seems like, uh, it, it seems like if it ever happens again, we're going to get it. As it was, their violence was directed at property. There was not so much as one single case of a mob attacking and beating an innocent bystander or a cop, although many police officers were wounded by thrown bottles and bricks. And there was the case of Detective Richard Buggy, who was still hospitalized with possible spinal damage, thanks to being thrown down a flight of stairs by looters who were trying to escape arrest. One cop trying to capture a looter was shot and wounded in the Bronx. At Brooklyn Jewish Hospital and Medical Center, emergency generators failed. Surgical teams and emergency service personnel set up a makeshift field hospital in the parking lot. The fire department rushed in high-intensity spotlights. One nurse described it like wartime and said, we're at the battlefront. Boxes of gauze bandages were stacked on a station wagon. Soiled sheets, bottles of disinfectant, and litters were piled nearby. And in the middle, surgeons, nurses, and orderlies worked on a seemingly endless flow of patients. Glass cuts, knife wounds, injuries of violence on New York's darkest night. 
I was working two murders on the four phones on my desk at police headquarters when it suddenly happened. For the first few seconds, I didn't give it any thought. What the hell, I told myself, they'll come back on. I then turned in my chair, looked out the window in the direction of Wall Street, the financial district, the World Trade Center, and the Brooklyn Bridge. Everything was pitch black. My God, I remembered saying, it's a blackout. With the aid of a match, I immediately dialed my city desk. They too were experiencing the same eerie feelings. Thanks, Pat, my editor said, get all you can. The next seven hours were hell and sweat. With the help of four candles I located in my locker, I began dialing the police precincts and the boroughs I knew from past experience would be the hardest hit in terms of looting. The devastation wreaked upon businesses in the hours of darkness that followed could not be imagined in one's wildest dreams. When human beings suddenly turned into animals and robbed, looted, wrecked, and burned homes to the tune of millions of dollars, news of which people in the civilized world could not possibly believe, a hardened police reporter had only one thought in mind, get the story. Gathering the information, which would be page one for days to follow in newspapers throughout the country, wasn't exactly easy. The, the illumination of the candles wasn't bright enough. On, on three occasions, I burned the index fingers of both hands, dialing various precincts. Uppermost in mine were the victims of muggings trapped in darkened subway trains, underground, and vehicles inching their way through tunnels and persons stuck on elevators were also major challenges. I phoned a total of 55 precincts and commands to get news on the blackout. I had presumed mistakenly, fortunately, that a record number of homicides would be committed. The animals were having a field day and they couldn't care less about murders which unfortunately New York has an average of four a day. My lunch hour came and went. I couldn't care less. Thousands of off-duty policemen volunteer, volunteered their help by calling their commands and reporting for duty. News reporters and photographers were no exception. Despite all the hardships, the news, holding to truest tradition of newspaper profession and with Mike O'Neill at the helm, published 40,000 copies. The time of the blackout was 9.34 p.m. It will be remembered forever. What magazine do millions of readers all over the world turn to each week? Time, of course. People read time for what's in it and what they get out of it. You'll be informed because inside you'll meet the rich and the poor, the bad and the beautiful, the high and the mighty. In time, you'll meet the butcher, the baker, and the troublemaker, happy, squeaky, and dark. Faith, hope, and charity, Lincolns, Fords, and Chevys. With time, every week you get ham, eggs, and juice. Time lets you know what people are thinking, because what certain people are thinking influences whether the world is at peace or war. Time doesn't stand still. With correspondents all over the world, we can call the balls and the strikes, the crime and the punishment. And what we see, you see. Whether it's on the battlefield or playing field, we'll tell you who's dropping the ball and who's running with it. And whether it's in front of the camera or behind the curtain, in art galleries or in the fashion shows, time will be there. And so will you, because time covers what you're interested in. And now you can receive time for only half price at our money-saving basic subscription price of 50 cents an issue, half the newsstand price. So for only $12, you can receive 24 issues of time. Just call this toll-free number, 800-621-8200. You'll save 50%. Call now so you start right, on time. The offer is half price. The phone call is free. To receive 24 issues of time for only $12, call this toll-free number now, 800-621-8200. Or write time, Time Life Building, Chicago, Illinois, 60611. For those of us who waited through the long night, dawn on the morning of July the 14th was a welcome sight. 
the blackness of a starless night was slowly illuminated by a bright sun. But the light of day didn't improve what we saw. It brought home the sickening reality that some New Yorkers had taken advantage of the city's blindness. They ran through the streets in an orgy of robbery and arson. It's impossible to describe the pandemonium on the streets of Harlem, the South Bronx, or Bushwick. But if you had driven with us that day, this is some of what you would have seen and heard. Lights went out at 9.30, and about there was a dead silence for possibly three to five minutes, and suddenly a yell came up from the street. The sound of, of I guess it must have been a thousand voices, just, just at a scream of, of exultion? I don't know, really. And uh, I said to Belle, my wife, uh, oh, oh, the lights are out, and I think there's going to be hell to pay tonight. But then we didn't hear any more, and we didn't think any more about it until about midnight. And at midnight, we heard the sounds of feet in the street. You couldn't see the faces. All you could hear was the sound of feet running and the sound of, uh, and then the sound of glass being smashed or the, or the storefronts being ripped open. The noise was frightening. The noise, the noise must have been like it was in Nazi Germany in 1932 when, when the stormtroopers invaded the homes of people and ripped them out. Here they were invading the places of business. This store wasn't hit. What did you think while you and your wife were inside and you were listening to these sounds of what you thought were, I guess, the end of your business? That all your years of work can be wiped out in a minute by just one kid with a, with a, a milk box to throw through your window or, or five kids to tear down the gate or to do uh, the looting. Why didn't you come down? I think I was afraid. I had a strong feeling that uh, it was like a witch's night outside and it wasn't the proper place for people to be walking. Uh, at three o'clock in the morning when I was just about terrified because I'd started to yell out the window at the looters going past with the uh, pieces of furniture and things like that, 
And uh, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I got a telephone call from a young man who works for me here. He said, uh, you're okay, boss? He said, and there's eight of us sitting outside the store. He said, all the guys from the neighborhood are sitting there drinking beer, and we're watching it. So that was a uh, something that helped my, my, my doubts and my worries. Uh, just about the same time, they smashed the window in the bar next door. They smashed and looted the window of the hardware store three doors away, and also the Spanish grocery a couple of doors away. There was an attempt made on the liquor store directly across the street, but a young man who really deserves mention, uh, the guard in 733 over there, came out with a gun and said, the first son of a bitch who touches this is going to get shot. And I understand that he's had threats since then, but uh, he protected those two stores. Uh, there were villains, but there were a lot of heroes. Who are some of the heroes? Well, as I said, that young man and the police in the 24th, hampered as they were, did a good job. They really, you know, they, they at uh, 3 o'clock when we heard the first uh, really smashing glass in the store on, underneath our window was being uh, looted, we called 911. And during that period of time, they must have had thousands of calls, but within five minutes, between five and ten minutes, there were three squad cars there, and they really saved that man's business. But about your business, can you describe what you felt when you got a call from, the, from that employee? Gratitude. What did you say to the people who stood in front of your store? Thank you. That's all. Do you, do you, why did they do that? Do you know? I've why you? Here. Why your I've store? Been here since 1932. I've seen this neighborhood come and go and come back again from a middle-class Jewish, Irish, Italian neighborhood to a predominantly rooming house neighborhood and back to a middle-class integrated neighborhood. It's as good now as it ever was. And I have never had a bad relationship with any person that, oh, I've had a drunk in the store who's bothered me and a guy who said, uh, I'll set fire to your place, you know, or something like that when I've uh, put him out. But with the people in the area, I've given them credit, I've cashed their checks, I've helped them in their time of need, I've gotten lawyers for them, I've gone bail for them. I've done all the things that a community-minded person who cares for his fellow men has to do. But whether that's responsible for my not getting hit, I can't say. Whether it was just dumb luck that they weren't after food stores. And, and that I was here. They were after food stores in some area. But not around here much. Now, what are you going to do now? What do you think of the area, of New York, and the future? I was frightened silly. And I said to Bell when we talked about it that day, uh, I said, I think this is the finish for New York. This is the final blow. But I've talked to 100 people since then, and it's not the finish. New York is here, it will live through this, it will grow out of this, it will pass this by, it grew out of the riots, it learned from them, it will learn from this too. Uh, it's a hell of a town and there are great people in it and you have to love them. The looters, the arsonists, the sickness that's in the air in some sections, you have to take into consideration of what's happening to them what has happened to them, uh, the feeling that there is no place to go, there is no, nowhere to climb. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing. I don't think that associa associations of uh, social workers really help. I don't think that uh, uh, the people who grab what they can in the city and road run out to the suburbs to live at night really help. But we're New Yorkers. How we help, and that's all I can tell you. If New York is going to endure, it must rely heavily on its police and fire services. Both responded quickly to their jobs on the 13th and 14th, but the demand was enormous. During the 25 hours of the blackout, there were 15,000 calls to number 911, 10 times the normal amount. There were 2,724 fire alarms, over 1,000 fires, and 55 firemen were injured. 
In this city of budget cuts and fiscal crisis, can our police and fire services handle a disaster of this magnitude? Should they have called on the National Guard? To discuss this question with Jeff Kamen and me, Mario Marola, mayoral candidate, Mario Cuomo. Chief of the City Fire Bureau, Joseph Flynn. Mayoral candidate, Joel Harnett. And Police Commissioner, Michael Codd. Commissioner Codd, you and I have known each other for a great number of years now. I just want to ask you one question to start this. Your own street cops told me that so long as the looters, the rioters, were confined to their own neighborhoods, they felt that they could hold back, hold their fire, and try to contain the situation and watch out for human life primarily. What if those looters had banded together and marched south out of the ghetto in Manhattan, for instance, into the Fifth Avenue downtown shopping district? Would your philosophy and policy have changed? I don't think so. And uh, I don't know that we can uh, try to answer now a pure uh, hypothetical question. The fact of the matter is the looters were arrested and stopped where they were. There wasn't any, if you will, march out of uh, their residential area. Were you prepared for one if it happened? Yes, I think we were. What would you have done? We would have used the necessary force to prevent any spread of the disorder. Including deadly force if necessary? If necessary. Would you have had... Now, when I say if necessary, you've got to remember that there are both legal and moral restraints on the random and reckless use of force. And uh, we don't condone that under any circumstances. Commissioner, would you have had that force available? It's reported that 10,000 men who were uh, called back into New York for duty did not show up. There's no would truth. There is no truth to that. We have some 21,000 police officers and detectives if we want to deal with the basic rank that does the bulk of the work. Of that number, 2,500 were on vacation. There were 1,500 on sick reports. So we immediately discount that 21,000 by 4,000. We're talking then of a number just over 17,000. Of that number, we have documented almost 15,500 who did in fact report. There are additional numbers and reports that we've gotten. We have not used them at the present time because we know there are some duplications because of the shifting that we did of manpower. So that we know that there are less than 1,500 that we haven't accounted for. How many men were actually on duty the night of the blackout? How many men did you use? Not how many men reported in and waited for maybe another order from you, but how many men were actually used? We used during the period from 9.34 and 9.35 until 8 o'clock the following morning some 11, better than 11,000 police officers and detectives and an additional 2,000 supervisors. So there were 13,000 members of the department either supervisors or police officers and detectives on the street or at their assigned duties. Where did the report of 10,000 men not coming in ever come from? I don't know. It came from the media. It didn't come from the department. People, people forget that there are always people on vacation, that there are always people sick. They seem to act on the assumption that all members should at all times be present, and you don't run a department in that fashion. You've got to be prepared to take care of that next period of time. So you do have to adequately rest your people. Commissioner Codd, one quick question for you now. What is the manner of life in terms of a riot situation? Who controls police policy, you or Mayor Bean? I do. Plain and simple? Absolutely. Chief Flynn, I am told by battalion chiefs in the street and members of the Uniformed Fire Officers Association that the fire department of the city of New York was so pressed the night of the blackout that had you had a major fire in any area where there was not looting, that chunks of the city could have burned right to the ground. How say you? We always maintained an uh, adequate presence in all of the boroughs, particularly in the boroughs that were not affected by the rioting and by the looting and by the vandalism. For example, in Staten Island, although we relocated companies into Brooklyn where the heavy fire situation was, we still never went below uh, 13 engines and I believe it was nine ladders on Staten Island, which would have been sufficient to handle a serious fire. The same thing pertained in Queens. You were ready for anything? Uh, we felt that we had adequate resources on hand to handle a major fire in any of the other boroughs. As a matter of fact, there was a very fluid situation for the whole night. For example, where we had taken companies from Staten Island into Brooklyn and Queens into Brooklyn, when the situation started to stabilize there, 
We then sent companies from Brooklyn into the Bronx where the situation was still bad. And what we maintained on a half hourly check with all the boroughs, and I had a borough commander in each one of the communication centers, was a uh, status report of all of our engine companies and ladder companies that we had available. And at no time did we get into a situation that was in extremists in the event that we had had a serious fire in Queens or in Staten Island or in Lower Manhattan. Mr. Cuomo, you've spoken out several times yeah. on cutbacks affecting police, especially the police department. I think you have something to say now, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I, I must tell you uh, that both these descriptions, and I know both these gentlemen have enormous respect for them, but neither description jives with what I understand to be the realities from having talked to policemen and firemen. For example, as head of the Division of Fire Prevention and Control statewide, we did ask the fire department if it wanted to implement the fire mobilization plan, and it said no, there was no need for it. And yet I went to College Point and discovered a school had burned down in College Point because the only engine in College Point had left for the Bronx, and the people in the neighborhood tell me that it was an hour and a half before an engine got there. I talked to property owners and store owners in the Bronx who said they stood protecting their own property with a baseball bat while two policemen said that they couldn't intervene with the looters because there were too many of them. To, so to suggest that you successfully contained the looting where it was and apprehended the loot is, it seems to me, frankly, Commissioner, unrealistic. Sure, there were over 4,000 arrests, but I've spoken to all kinds of people who watched their stores being looted. They got wiped out. Much of the looting was done the next day. It seems to me that while the policemen who were available did a superb job, and I, I have enormous respect for them, there was a need for help. There was a need for backup. Um, I was disappointed that the guard, not on the front line, but that the guard wasn't brought in as backup, that the troopers weren't there as backup. To sit in houses in Queens where there was low crime and no trouble and free up your troops to get to the front line uh, uh, of, of difficulty because my information is that the looting wasn't stopped. And that's what the people are outraged at. Excuse me, Mr. Cuomo. Mr. Harnett, uh, Mr. Cuomo has mentioned that they needed backup, that there were too many looters. Do, are you a, a supporter of a stronger auxiliary police force? Yes, I am. I think if we had had a much larger auxiliary police force, it would have been highly beneficial in this situation. They could have performed the backup services that Mario was talking about. They could have been in the low crime areas. They could have been directing traffic around the city. It's obvious that we didn't have a sufficient number of police to contain the situation. My view, they should have called the National Guard to the situation. Let me uh, say something on that. We do have an ample auxiliary police, very trained, very dedicated auxiliary police, and they did report and they did do great work. And as far as using them uh, at that time for the regulation and direction of traffic, that was of absolutely no priority. That would be wasting manpower. The auxiliary police did patrol. Well, I don't agree with that because you have to have an orderly city. You had a city that was blacked out. You had to have people all over that city directing traffic, and thank God there were so many citizens willing to do it, and a police force all over that city to protect the rest of the city. Thank what you, is Mr. your Arnett. feeling about it? Excuse me, Jim. Sorry. District Attorney of the Bronx, Mario Marola, how pressed was the criminal justice system? Did it fall apart under the strain of almost 4,000 arrests? Well, obviously the criminal justice system functioned. It's still working. We had a system that was geared to handle in Bronx County something like 100 arrests a day, and all of a sudden we were faced with 1,000 arrests. And it should be pointed out that we didn't have power for 24 hours, and we're dependent upon electrical power in order to get our prints from Albany. Yes, there were a lot of strains, a lot of buckles on the criminal justice system, but the system was not geared uh, for that amount of arrest. I think that we've worked very well. Gentlemen, I'm sorry that's all we have time for. Thank you very much for being with us. <laughs> Later in this report, we'll examine the legal questions. And now the criminal justice system responded to New York's night of darkness. It was a test of public morality, and it's been flunked rather spectacularly. The people who looted and robbed and set fires, of course, flunked it. But I think that um, the white people who've been so critical have flunked it in a certain sense, too. Um, I find I'm troubled by people who are righteous over much the people who've repressed their racism, repressed their hatred, and it's as if this blackout with its uh, looting had given people a license to hate. Um, I'm so tired of hearing the righteous sputtering. I'm sorry about the poor little shopkeepers. I despise the looters. On the other hand, you cannot keep people in a condition of servitude for what? Um, 
12 generations and expect that they're going to behave with, with grace under pressure. They're not. They're going to steal. Their, their whole philosophy is snatch, grab, and run. One of the most tiresome, back-breaking household chores is mopping and waxing floors and the constant bending, stooping, and straining to wring out your mop. Well, here is the greatest work saver to come along in years. It's the fabulous Rolomatic Mop and Waxer with this built-in remote control wringer and a sponge rubber head that always stays soft and absorbent. Watch how it quickly soaks up water. And for wringing, just flip the lever. The rollers do all the work. No more bending or stooping, and your hands never touch the water. And the Rolomatic Mop won't drip, so it's perfect for washing walls, ceilings, and windows. The absorbent sponge rubber head easily picks up the messiest spills, spreads liquid wax evenly and thinly without streaking. So get the Rolomatic today. It's the easiest, most convenient mop and waxer you've ever used. If you don't agree, simply return it to manufacturer for full refund. The Rolomatic mop and waxer, an ideal gift, only $8.95 at Woolworth and Woolco, Corvettes and Sears. Complete satisfaction or return to place of purchase or manufacturer. I'm no chick. I'm a woman. I got myself a Ford Mustang because I was tired of being treated like some bird in a gilded cage. I like my Mustang because it gives me the feeling I can be everything a woman can be. My Mustang gives me the feeling of breaking out of this cage. I like it. You'll like it. You'll like it. You'll like it. You'll like your Ford dealer's year-end clearance prices, too. Here you go. Continue celebrating the bicentennial by going back where you came from. To Scotland, Ireland, or Merry Old England. Or wherever you want to go. You call the shop. Make mine Hawaii. And you'll save lots of coin if you call Calentours. Ha ha! At 836-6433. Calentours will send you. Whenever anyone asks for the explanation of a crime, you have to discuss it on two planes. The first is the one that seems to be accepted now, namely that environmental pressure, racism, poverty, bad slum conditions are responsible for this. In other words, it is expressed on the theory that society prepares the crime and the criminal only executes it. But I think this is a very inadequate explanation for the looting that took place. So we go to the second plane. A society must have a kind of value which is beyond self-interest. The moment that we think only of ourselves, of immediate gratification, then crime is the shortcut to that gratification. And today we are relaxed in all of our moral values not merely in the depressed areas, but in the middle class areas and the rich areas from which a great deal of crime comes. Lack of respect for teachers, for parents, for authority, for law, for the government. Unfortunately, that general condition, when it breaks out in a special crisis, causes what it does. Balzac said that every criminal is an atheist, even if he doesn't know it. And unless we meet the test of character, which is how you would conduct yourself if you were guaranteed not to be caught. Unless you meet that test of character, you're going to have crime in some form or other, irrespective of the immediate incendiary situation. So I think that unless we develop an overall general climate of more moral value, you will not have a cessation of these situations. Mr. Bosch. Mr. Neiser, thank you. Earlier, we showed you scenes of the looting Wednesday night and during the day on Thursday. 3,776 people arrested. Thousands more fled the gutted stores before police arrived. They paraded before television cameras with their loot. They laughed, joked, and danced in the streets. It was a holiday of lawlessness. Did they think about what they were doing? Did they feel any pangs of guilt? Jeff Kamen talked with several of the looters and some of their neighbors who said, that they just held back. 
Police came with four cars, right? They ran up on the sidewalk. They blocked the doorways off, right? I jump over one car, right? They tell me to hard. I tell them, yo, you know? I said, everybody else is still and watching now still, you know? They should have just took what they wanted. That's all. They had to burn the place down. Yeah. Now we got nowhere to shop. Nowhere to shop. You got to go all the way to Pathmark. And that's the where. Why was it that everyone was looting? Could somebody give me an insight into that? They didn't want to give nobody no jobs. You know, the government said that they, the city said they don't have no money, but they got money. So now, by nobody working, so this is 77. Everybody know that times is hard now. People, they want things. They want luxury, you know, furniture, clothing, so, and food. So this is the first opportunity they got to get it. So they're going to take it. You know, if I was out there myself, I would have got what I wanted too. You were not among the looters? No, I wasn't. Unfortunate. How do you feel about it? I feel it was bad. It was bad. It shouldn't be done. I do not feel that it was bad. Everybody, if you want to loot, you're going to loot. That's right. Well, when we gonna, where are you going to go shopping like now? Yeah, Would you answer yeah. the question? Did you lose? Yeah. No. You didn't? No, I did not. Where were you at the time? You didn't lose. My, my brother did it. My brother did it. You yeah. see? You think the thing is did you not lose if it was your own business? Because you know why? Because people loot. Man, to loot, to be looting, to get something for their own self. That's the way it works. I know. That's the way it always yeah, going to be. Right, now, look, there's a, there's a word that I grew up with, that I think everybody grew up with, which is called morality, which is knowing the difference between right and wrong. Now, what do you think about the morality of looting? Mm, I really don't know. Well, see, my opinion is that, you know, the people around here, they poor, and they saw it, you know, and the cops, they didn't tell them, you know, that when they first came through, they said, hey, you know, go ahead, you know, do it, you know? You heard police officers say, go ahead and do it? Right. They came through, you know, several times. They wasn't stopping the people, you know, because they was around here, right? It was too dark. The cops came and they parked the cars there and they scared everybody out and they cut out because they were scared too. Streets by harried police officers. The days following the blackout became a trial by heat. The city's criminal justice system was swamped. Jails were overcrowded. The tombs was temporarily reopened. There weren't enough soap, toilet facilities, food, or in some cases, adequate space to lie down. There are chances, or rather charges, the city ignored the constitutional rights of the thousands of people it arrested in those hours. Howard Tuckner and I will discuss these problems with attorney Louis Neiser, Michael Russett of the Association of Legal Aid, criminal court judge Erwin Brownstein, commissioner of corrections Benjamin Malcolm, Peter Tufo, chairman of the New York City Board of Corrections, and mayoral candidate Ed <coughs> Koch. Howard, if you'll begin the questioning. Congressman Koch, in light of what happened do you think that Mayor Beam acted correctly as far as the courts were concerned? Should the National Guard have been called in? We were disgraced by professional burglars and perhaps amateur looters, but did we disgrace ourselves more the by the handling of the criminal justice system? The answer is yes. We disgraced ourselves. The mayor did a lousy job. There should have been a curfew in the riot areas. The National Guard, in my judgment, should have been alerted and brought in, not to the riot areas, but into the non-riot areas, so as to release the cops who were then doing police duty in the non-riot areas, as well as traffic duty in the rest of the uh, city. With respect to uh, the criminal justice system, I think we're going to see a kind of a cover-up operation, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. I've watched the television in the last couple of days, and I've watched the judges, and they've said, it wasn't us, it was the DA, it was uh, the police, and I've watched uh, the police. And they say, it wasn't us, it was the judges. And I watched uh, Mario Marola, who said uh, on one occasion that only three judges who were not on duty came into the Bronx as volunteers to assist those judges who were on duty uh, to process uh, those who were going to be arraigned. What I'm hoping is that if there is to be an investigation, and I know that Peter Tufo just told me that there is to be one, that it will cover all of those things, and instead of the mayor calling for an investigation of Con Ed, which is done by the state and the federal government, he ought to be calling for an investigation of why the city didn't have a plan to deal with all of the problems that came out of that rioting and that looting. Now, Judge Brownstein, you are a judge. He's talking about judges. How would uh, you respond to that? I think that uh, Congressman Koch is uh, possibly not familiar with what went on. Tell me. At 7.30 in the morning on Thursday, my administrative judge, Judge Rubin, and I went to the criminal court 
I went down into the pit where the prisoners from the night before were being detained. Uh, he and I spoke with the correction department, and about an hour after we had uh, been there, there were more judges in the building than we needed for three times the amount of the looters that had been arrested. Uh, we were in a position to begin working and did begin working. By 9.30, the court was open, and the business of the night before had been cleaned up, and we were ready to go. Uh, we identified where the looters had been housed. There were 100 at one precinct, 90 at another precinct. We had some at the tombs. Uh, the correction department opened its facilities, fortunately, and were able to house them. When I went back to the Supreme Court, where I am assigned, with my administrative judge, we found 22 judges sitting outside that building in a building that was closed where they were not needed. Our building was closed, the Superior Court, and every one of those judges volunteered to go down to the lower court and to work, and so I must, if I'm a little upset at it, it's because I think you don't know what but you're talking about. But let me ask about. you this. If, if everything went so well, why, did, why were people kept incarcerated for that number of days? Well, uh, it's if very simple. every judge was doing simple. his job, it's tell me why. Simple. Before a man can be brought to a courtroom, he's got to be booked and he's got to be fingerprinted. And there were still people by Friday afternoon who had not been fingerprinted. We have spent millions of dollars on the New York State Intelligence and Identification System, which simply, in, in our terms, means getting a rap sheet, getting a prior criminal record, and we couldn't get them. And the law is very clear. A judge cannot arraign a defendant who doesn't have a criminal record. Excuse me, let me finish. In addition to that, we can't arraign a defendant where we have no police officer. And police officers were returned to the street. The emergency on Thursday was still on. The crisis was still going as far as we knew. And we were trying to find it out, I assure you. So far as we knew, we couldn't get enough police officers back into the courthouse to sign those complaints. Well, excuse me, sir, but in the event of a crisis, shouldn't a criminal justice system take this into account? New York is a, the largest city. These things are, have been known to happen before. Shouldn't this have been taken into account? What I'm really asking you and everyone on this panel is our criminal justice system, what it should be for what New York is. Could I speak to that? Please. Can I just complete this statement, Peter? I'm sorry to interrupt, but there are other aspects of the system you should be aware of. We have the pretrial services agency, which must interview a defendant before he gets to that court for background purposes. It's just important with that interview as a fingerprint and rap sheet is. Those kids, I, I met the director of the pretrial services agency in the dark holding a candle at 7.30 in the morning in that courthouse where we already had people coming in. He had his kids working 24 hours but a sir, day. So these are things that must happen whether or not there of is a Of course, blackout. but you see the court doesn't start the process. The arrest starts the process. The police must bring the defendant to the courthouse. The complaint must be drawn. He must be booked. And we that can't the touch question, a defendant until he gets the there. Question, sir. Judge, should, should the not bottom that line is, did, of you, that did they changed. do the job? And the bottom line Our is that they did, did not. The job. That's not but, so. Well, well gentlemen, 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 please, for a moment. Mr. Trufo. Okay. Mr. Trufo. This seems to me an instant replay of Rashomon, because there are four elements in the criminal justice system. The police, the courts, corrections, and the prosecution and defense. Each of them saw this blackout, this crisis, from their own perspective. From what I observed during the five days that I was there, each of them did their individual jobs well. The police did a very good job using restraint on the streets, made uh, ten times as many arrests during the, the blackout looting as they made during the, the riots of 1967, 1968, 65. The correction officers acted with great humanity. They acted with great restraint, put in a lot of overtime. The judges were there. I saw them sitting. They were sitting there. The legal aid uh, attorneys were there working overtime, volunteering. The DAs were there. Everybody was working. The system didn't work. It failed. And that's why everyone saw it from their own perspective, but no one put it together. Why did the system fail? One, because there was no preparation for an emergency like this. Two, the system was set up to fail. There is a criminal justice system that spends $1.3 billion every year into these four elements. 80% of that is at the top of the funnel. It's devoted toward providing police services on the streets and making arrests. That 80% then funnels down into the rest of the system, into the judges, which are about 7% of the system, into the DAs and legal defense, which are about 3% of the system, and into corrections, which is about 10%. The rest of the system couldn't handle what the police brought to it. All right, so what you're saying, and stop me if I'm wrong, is that in the future, if we have something like this, or perhaps even worse, 
the system will still fail unless something's done. What must be done? First, a political decision has to be made to devote the resources to the system uh, to back up the political decisions that are made. If the political decision is to make sweeps, be tough on looters, be tough on people suspected of looting, then you've got to have the resources to back up that political decision. Are you talking decision. about being tough on the street or Being tough beyond either that? on the street or in court. If the police bring in a lot of people and you have to house them in police precincts or in court pens, you've got to have the facilities to deal with them. If the judges set high bails and are going to re remand a lot of people or, or cause a lot of people to be sent to jail, you've got to have a corrections budget that's ready for that. Nobody was ready for that. And it seems to me that it's just clear that a city like this can have an emergency at any time. It doesn't have to be a blackout. It could be a hurricane, a terrorist attack, a riot, or Would a you blackout. agree, however, that we do have the facilities? No, we don't have the facilities to handle no, this, I, this number of arrests I, I in the jails. I was about to ask you that. We, we have the police available to make this number of arrests. We have Why the not judges have available. central locations for uh, distributing or housing? Well, I think that's, a, that's a very good question. There have been emergency preparedness plans in the past that have recommended that schools be set up as central areas in each of the boroughs, and that uh, food and linen and bedding and that kind of thing be made available. It wasn't done this well, time. Well, if we had the facilities, Mr. Tufo, would uh, minors, would juveniles be put into the tombs and have to stay there in many cases for three and four days with adults? Let me speak to that. Please. <coughs> you know, in 1969, 1970, we had 15,000 prisoners in our institutions here in New York City. At the time of the blackout, we only had 6,500. Now, we have places to put them. We can't stock them into court pens. We can put them on Rikers Island. We can put them in various other places. We call an emergency after the inmates in the Bronx House of Detention uh, rioted and tore up three uh, dormitories there. And we had to go there with force in the middle of the night and use just a demonstration of force in order to evacuate 145 inmates, uh, which made us short. Now, another 145 places. We have, we have facilities throughout the city, and I, when I call the emergency, it meant I could double sell. And I call the emergency for the entire department. I have to ask you to hurry May on, I sir? interrupt just for a moment because Mr. Russick hasn't had a chance yet? I would disagree with Judge Brownstein, and I would have to disagree with Mr. Tufo. I think the system could have dealt with this crisis much better than it did. I'm not saying that all those who were arrested could have been arraigned uh, within a day or two days, but surely they could have been arraigned sooner than five or six as uh, has taken place. In terms of fingerprints that Judge Brownstein mentions, there were fingerprints available, I understand, at one police plaza in New York City. As far as police officers coming in and processing cases, there's a system called pre-arraignment, which works in the Bronx, where police officers are, are excused from the arraignment court themselves. There's no reason that that system could not have been implemented throughout the entire city. We did pre-arraignment. Mr. Tufo, finally. Let, let's get a comment from Mr. Neiser. Here. Right. I think this is a classic conflict between precious rights. Um, you can't argue one side is right or wrong in an emergency. If you wanted to protect the civil rights of all the arrested people, then uh, you'd have to let them free because they were held too long. And I don't think anybody here is for that. If, on the other hand, you, in an emergency, realize the crowded conditions that you didn't expect unless you had another billion dollars to build the proper court facilities, then under those circumstances, if you favor what was done and undergo it on the same theory as if there were an epidemic, Mr. Nash, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to you, would cut, you would stop civil rights. Excuse, Excuse me, me, sir. We'll have to there. We are out there. of time for this section. I want thank to thank you. you all for joining us. Well, how did the media respond to this blackout? Did they help? or did they inflame the problems? We'll examine that issue in just a moment. And this is for the bathroom. Oh, Helen, you're smart about decorating, but not about toothpaste. Letting Bobby use that aim? I wouldn't let my kids go near it. They're cavity prone. So is he. All the more reason to use fluoride toothpaste. Fluoride fights cavities. AIM has fluoride. AIM fights cavities. But AIM is a gel. AIM tastes good. I like it. He likes it, Blanche. Well, I don't know. I'm almost scared to switch. Look, Blanche, Bobby's cavity prone. Would I take chances? AIM has fluoride. AIM fights cavities. And he likes it. So maybe he's brushing longer. And I know his checkups have been good. You mean AIM really does fight cavities? Yes. 
And he's cavity prone. Good checkups? Helen, you do have great taste. We'll try AIM. For good checkups in the cavity prone years, take AIM against cavities. You know, Ford's been turning out bestsellers since the first Ford. Over the last few years, Pinto's been America's best-selling small car. I like the way you don't have to think twice in buying a Pinto. The thinking's in the car itself. It's thoughtfully engineered for great mileage. It's thoughtfully designed, it's thoughtfully priced. I like the way Pinto made it to the top. By thinking of me. I like it. You'll like it. You'll like it. You'll like it. You'll like your Ford dealer's year-end clearance prices, too. <laughs> Viva is great. I mean, um, I, this is something. Okay, switch, and let's do the Viva test again. Are your towels absorbing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, now scrub with an abrasive cleanser. Come on, really scrub. Okay, stop. Stop. Okay, pick them up by the corners. What did you see happen again? Same thing that happened the first time. The bounty fell apart, and the Viva didn't. Can your towel pass the Viva test? The blackout literally struck us like lightning. The power went off in Manhattan just 26 minutes before Steve and I were scheduled to begin our regular evening report. Instead, we found ourselves working by candlelight, trying in those first few minutes to determine just how widespread the blackout was. Because they had emergency generators, the phone company kept open our lines of communication. We were off the air, literally working in the dark. But the all-news radio stations managed either to stay on the air or get back on within seconds. It was radio's night, and they did it on their own. The sophisticated computers that drive the teletypes were silent. All of us relied on the radio reporters to keep us up to the minute on development at police headquarters, with Con Ed, and on the streets. It was the night of the transistor and car radio. Television screens throughout New York and Westchester were black. WNBC-TV managed to get back on the air at 11.02 that night. WCBS-TV only lost a few minutes. Both stations had auxiliary generators at the Empire State Building to keep their transmitters on. Both began producing news specials. Chuck Scarborough and Tony Guide on Channel 4, Jim Jensen and Dave Marish on Channel 2. It wasn't easy. Each team operated with a single light in a corner of their newsroom. But those of us affected by the blackout couldn't see or hear them. Their reports were watched on Long Island and in New Jersey. Here's part of what people who had power saw and heard. The power went off completely in uh, Manhattan and in Westchester, and this is shades of 1965. What I have here, I don't know if you can see this. We went to the library by candlelight. This is Life magazine from November 19th, 1965. Uh, 528 p.m. November 9th, the lights went out. That was the story. And if you turn to page 36 for me, Tony, there are, uh, this is awfully crowded right here. In, it's a small but it's kind of cozy, you know? We should work where together they, like this more often. Yeah, where do they number the pages? Um, just a second. We're going to, what I, I think it's fascinating because this is probably a little bit of what's going on right now. Um, there. There we okay. go. Okay. All right, let's see. I don't know whether whether we can make a picture on this camera with this. Probably not. Let's tilt it forward a little bit. All right, there it is. There was Manhattan. It's taken by a Life magazine photographer in 1965 during the Great Power Outage. Now, you're sitting on my wire. Now, let me get over here, Tony. This is terrific. I think we're violating some union agreement here about prop men, but uh, these are photos taken before and after photos in uh, 1965. We're in just a little bit. Manhattan before the lights went out, Manhattan after the lights went out. We had a report of a, of a robbery and a shooting uh, up in Harlem, but uh, that would have happened probably lights out or not. You have the usual amount Well, there of have been reports of some looting in areas of yeah. Brooklyn, 14th Street on the Upper West Side, but again, the reports are that the police have all these situations under control. Mayor Beam has gone to City Hall. He set up an emergency uh, uh, headquarters there. Police Commissioner Cobb has been summoned down there, Acting Fire Commissioner Murphy, uh, emergency banks with telephone. Even for those of us who were not on on the air that night, the work of journalism went on, and all of us have our stories, how we tried to cope that night. Gossip columnist Doris Lilly has hers. The night the lights went out, I was home, sitting in front of the television set, eating a tuna fish sandwich. I'd been at a cocktail party earlier that evening, but I wanted to get home. I had to be home between 9 and 9.30 because I was expecting a call from London. A friend of mine was going to call me and tell me when Prince Charles was getting married and who he was going to marry. And then the lights went out. Now, I knew that I had a flashlight because I'd paid $14 for one about two weeks before. 
but I couldn't find it. I couldn't find three transistor radios that I knew I had, but I'd put in closets someplace. And I couldn't even find candles. So I went around the apartment with a cigarette lighter like this, ran into a table, and realized that on this table were two candelabras with 12 candles on them. So I lit all the candles, went into my bedroom like a latter-day uh, Lady Macbeth, went to bed and went to sleep. Got up the next morning, packed, and went out to East Hampton. Now, many, many people from New York that could get away got away, and they went out to East Hampton and just to get away from it all because everyone was afraid that the lights would go out again. And I saw Larry Lockman. He's chairman of the board of Bloomingdale's. I saw the Paul Mannheims. I saw Lee Eastman. He's the father of Linda Eastman, who's married to Paul McCartney. And it was a lovely, cool, delicious time, but I never got my phone call from London, and I still don't know who Prince Charles is going to marry. <laughs> <laughs> the city's three major newspapers were faced with a mammoth problem. To get back in production, we have only to fire up a transmitter, turn on the cameras and microphones, and begin broadcasting. The Times and Daily News had to cope with an enormous logistics problem. The Times managed to get a 40-page edition out Thursday with the help of The Record in Hackensack, and the News put out a 32-page blackout edition with help from Newsday. The New York Post was unable to publish it at all on Thursday, but when he did get his paper back on the street Friday, publisher Robert Murdoch ordered a headline that screamed, 24 hours a night of terror. Deputy Mayor for Economic Development, Osborne Elliott, criticized the Post headline as sensationalism. But Murdoch sees it differently, with a publishing empire in New York alone that includes the Post, New York Magazine, Village Voice. Murdoch is worried about what the blackout pretends for our future. Well, it raises tremendous questions. Uh, the obvious questions of how to handle civil disorders, uh, how to handle mass looting without creating mob riots. Um, but there seem to me to be much bigger questions we have to address ourselves to now, and not just in New York, but in America. We have, in the great cities, great pools, armies of unemployed, um, underprivileged, uh, probably undereducated, but basically unskilled people. The vast majority of those people uh, are law-abiding good citizens, even if they're unfortunate and underprivileged. This was the criminal element amongst them. Uh, they weren't even hungry. The number of food stores that were looted were very minor. These people were going in to make money, to steal valuable TV sets, uh, furniture, and the like. Uh, the simple idea of stealing things to resell and to make money. It was a criminal action. And they should be treated the same as any other criminal action. How do you think Mayor Beam handled it? I thought that Mayor Beam himself uh, failed to give leadership and spent his day very largely with his press agent devising press conferences denouncing Con Ed, which he had all of the rest of the year to do, uh, when people were frankly terrified that the city was burning down around them. Um, and uh, I personally, and all the people I spoke to, very, felt very critical of the way the mayor was publicly handling it. Now, I know that people on his staff, like Deputy Mayor Comerfeld, was in touch with the governor, uh, we're acting very responsibly. I think the role of the police under Commissioner Card will be debated for a long time, particularly amongst the police themselves. The rank and file, I'm sure, would have preferred to be much tougher. Uh, the policy, though, coming from Commissioner Card and maybe even from Commissioner Murphy before then, uh, was to be very careful not to trigger a major race riot which they could not have controlled. There did exist a possibility for a while that they might call in the National Guard, and I think there were even rumors that they were thinking of bringing in uh, the army from Fort Dix. What would have happened if they had? Well, I think the National Guard was pretty much out in that half of the National Guard are in the police or the fire brigade anyway. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so, and there aren't all that many. Would there be enough National Guardsmen if they triggered a riot? At the, moment, at the time you had 10,000 people, say, looting stores and 200,000 watching them. The theory was that if anyone started shooting, you'd unite those two. You'd have 210,000 people on your hands rioting. Um, the National Guard couldn't have handled a riot of that size. Now, the alternative really, uh, all along, was if it got too far out of hand, they would have had to bring in the army. Do you see 
the aftermath of the blackout, and obviously crises that have hit the city before the blackout, but do you see this sort of thing pushing more and more people out of New York City and affecting a number of people who might have considered coming into New York? Yes. I think there's no doubt about it. I think that the looting and the arson that took place uh, have gone a long way to destroying, finally, more uh, neighborhoods, uh, which are going to be almost impossible to rebuild. I think our image was made by the television news services on Thursday night across the country, across the world. Um, and uh, it was an image of um, looting and burning. And it's going, that uh, made a very strong impression throughout the world, and certainly throughout this country. And it's going to take time uh, for, to, for that to be forgotten and to be replaced by thinking? the image of a city with a purpose and with excitement and as a, as a worthwhile and great center for this country. Do you think that was the wrong impression that the uh, TV industry gave? No, I think it simply reported very accurately and graphically what was going on. Another value-packed Sears red tag sale is here. Tomorrow only, save from 10 to 40% on many items. Sears quality at low red tag prices. Tomorrow only at Sears. Be ready. Here comes football. Sports Illustrated is bringing it your way. Starting with our two big football issues. Who will be number one among the colleges? You can check our top 20 teams and see if they match your 20. Then we'll hit you right on the numbers with scouting reports on the colleges and the pros. We'll tell you who's hitting and who's hurting. Because football isn't just X's and O's. It's the people that play the game. The heads, arms, hands, legs, and heart of football. All through the season, we'll tell you who's calling the plays and who's running them. Why some work, and some don't. The nation's best sports writers and photographers will bring you the lions and the tigers, the eagles and the rams, the birds and the bears. You'll get football by the inches, feet, and yards. You'll get the touchdowns and the letdowns. And we'll bring it to you Sports Illustrated style.